The American Conservative, 14th of February 2024, is Australia admonishing China? Is the Australian government, which leans to the left, timid on China? Longtime member of Parliament Anthony Albanese flew to a summit of the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, comprised of Australia, India, Japan, and the United States, as soon as he was sworn in as Prime Minister in May 2022. Advocates assert that the organization safeguards secure supply chains and freedom of navigation in the Indo-Pacific. Criticisms characterize containment of China as a precarious facade. Analysts promptly observe the parallels between his administration and his center-right predecessor, Scott Morrison, at least in the realm of foreign affairs. However, by November 2023, Albanese had traveled to Sydney to confer with Xi Jinping, the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. The discussion was deemed positive by the Australian Prime Minister, who also invited the Chinese leader to visit Canberra, the capital city. Due to China's economic influence, many nations have voiced concerns about CCP behavior but are hesitant to act on those concerns. Albanese's meetings within statements about China's leadership have sparked worries that the foundational alliance between the United States and Australia may not be as strong as anticipated and that Albanese will not partner in containing Beijing's regional ambitions. Contrary perspectives emerge from discussions with preeminent Australian security experts, equally influenced by developments in Beijing and Canberra. It is worth mentioning that among the alliances formed by the United States in Asia and the Pacific after World War II, including the Philippines, South Korea, Japan, Thailand, New Zealand, and Australia, the association with Canberra has arguably lacked significant controversy. Instances in which the alliance's worth has been called into question, popular rebellions against the American presence in Australia, or significant divergences in approaches to contemporary security concerns have been scarce, if non-existent. In recent years, several other alliances, including South Korea and the Philippines, have approached the brink of severe confrontation, if not complete discord. Notwithstanding this, it should be noted that divergences have occurred within the US-Australian alliance. Decades-old indicators suggested that Australian exporters could benefit immensely from the Chinese market, and China's foreign direct investment in Australia offered the country both advantageous prospects and possible obstacles. Australia's security reliance on the United States and its economic dependence on China began to raise concerns around the middle of the previous decade. During the initial days of the Trump administration, the right-leaning government led by Malcolm Turnbull enacted legislation aimed at curbing foreign meddling in domestic matters while simultaneously fostering a closer relationship with the United States via initiatives like the Quad. However, besides advocating for stable relations with China, Turnbull successfully concluded the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement in December 2015. It is worth noting that the text of his foreign interference laws did not specifically target any nations, even thought their names being widely known at the time. As a result of external interference, Australia's apprehensions regarding its relationship with China were gradually intensifying. Australia observed with caution as the People's Republic of China asserted ever-increasing territorial assertions in the South China Sea contrary to established international law and the desires of its smaller neighbors, imposed restrictions on the autonomy of Hong Kong, and proposed to participate in the development of Australia's 5G network, an offer that the government rejected in 2010 and outright prohibited in 2018. However, given that China serves as Australia's primary trading partner, including in the realms of iron ore, liquefied natural gas, coal, gold, and agricultural products, and that the free trade agreement grants Australia invaluable entry into the domestic market of the People's Republic of China, the conflicts were relatively minor in magnitude and reach. In 2020, the conflict between these competing dependencies appeared to have been resolved. Scott Morrison deposed Malcolm Turnbull as Liberal Party leader and Prime Minister in 2018. In 2020, Morrison's government mandated an international investigation into the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. Furthermore, in 2021, Morrison defied the Turnbull administration to establish the AUKUS Accord with the United States and Britain. In doing so, he reneged on an agreement made by his predecessor to procure submarines designed in France, which would have constituted the most substantial defense procurement in Australian history. Conversely, Morrison opted to procure nuclear-powered vessels with the assistance of the United States and Great Britain, a course of action condemned by China and Turnbull. Notwithstanding the measures implemented by Morrison, Beijing's decision-making process is the true catalyst for the decline in diplomatic ties between Australia and China. The PRC could have ignored Morrison's request for a COVID investigation, among other possible responses, however, it sanctioned Australia, 
imposing various restrictions on Australian products, including timber, lobster, and wine. The People's Republic of China PRC, had already developed a reputation for employing economic pressure, as evidenced by the sanctions imposed on South Korea in 2016-17 for permitting the installation of a US-made missile defense system on its territory and the withholding of rare earth mineral exports from Japan in 2010 over a territorial dispute. Beijing implemented additional escalatory measures in 2020, such as intensifying a border dispute with India into a military confrontation and adopting a progressively antagonistic public stance towards criticism, referred to as wolf warrior diplomacy. Beijing likely motivated these actions for particular purposes. Potentially, they intended to divert public attention away from their disastrous virus management by fostering the perception that the nation was internationally besieged and poised to respond with force. Nonetheless, such actions led to the deterioration of bilateral relations with several countries. India, Japan, South Korea, and the Philippines all made a decisive turn away from Beijing. Few shifted with the force and velocity of Australia. The Australian capital refused to yield to Chinese trade pressures. It strived to establish routine meetings of the Quad within months, and by 2021, it had ratified the AUKUS Treaty. Particularly harshly. Beijing reacted to this development by having its state media declare that Australians would be among the first to perish in the event of conflict. Australia maintained its proximity to the United States and its allies. The country in question exhibited a reluctance to make trade-oriented concessions to Beijing. Instead, it endeavored to rectify vulnerabilities in its supply chain by engaging in the Quad in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework IPEF. Then, in the spring of 2022, a resurgent Labour Party abruptly removed Scott Morrison and his party from power. How did this result in a novel approach towards the PRC and the United States? Many factors propelled the Labour Party's ascent to power following a nine-year absence, most of which were domestic as opposed to international in scope. Numerous lost Liberal seats were reclaimed by deal independents who advocated for socially progressive, election integrity, and new climate policies, as opposed to Labour Party members. However, the seat realignment resulted in the ascension of new candidates to power, one of whom was Albanese. During his time in Parliament, he consistently voiced dissenting opinions regarding U.S. foreign policy, encompassing the Iraq War and its position on Israel and Palestine. In addition, some familiar personalities were present. Since last spring, former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, a proficient Mandarin speaker who in 2008 abandoned the initial iteration of the Quad due to Chinese objections, has served as the ambassador to the United States. Following his inauguration, Albanese affirmed that the nation would not withdraw from AUKUS or the Quad nor attempt to distance itself from U.S. foreign policy in general. The United States continues to enjoy widespread support from the Australian populace, whereas China's popularity has diminished. Although the Labour Party has been in power for nearly two years, there have been grounds for doubting Australia's dedication, if not to the alliance and discouraging China. During Albanese's meetings with Chairman Tsai, especially in November, both parties expressed the importance of achieving diplomatic stability. China reinstated trade restrictions it had previously imposed on coal and barley in 2023 and declared its intention to reassess the burdensome 218% tariff it levied on Australian wine. This elicited a variety of reactions, including praise, the diplomacy of Albanese and his foreign minister, Penny Wong, and apprehensions that Canberra had granted Beijing an exemption for its exporters in return for unwarranted concessions. According to Graham Dobell of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, an appreciation of the Albanese government's similarities to Morrison fails to capture the full scope of its continuity. He describes it as having a slightly different tone but essentially the same temperature. Additionally, he argues that instead of perceiving Canberra as having lost its composure, observers should consider that Australia essentially made no concessions to Beijing in return for improved treatment. According to him, Beijing utilized Morrison's departure as an opportunity to lift trade restrictions that had failed to achieve their intended objective. China experienced widespread power outages in several cities at the start of 2021 due to the loss of Australian coal. In contrast, the value of Australia's exports increased in the three years following 2019 due to a surge in the price of Australian ore, the depletion of which would have catastrophic consequences for China's steel industry. China imposed the suffering, Dobell stated. China was the one who threatened to use its trade influence to bring us to our knees. According to John Quiggan, an economics professor at the University of Queensland, the dispute demonstrated that Australia was not, in fact, really dependent on China. 
It was not working, and China has decided to abandon that. If, the Chinese market, is closed, we can sell elsewhere, the Chinese can buy elsewhere, and prices don't change significantly, albeit with less efficient arrangements. Research indicates that Australia's other Asian partners, such as Japan and Korea, increased their efforts after China's restrictions were implemented. The transformation did not occur solely for economic reasons. Saurabh Gupta, an analyst at the Institute for China-America Studies in Washington, drew a parallel between Beijing's recent actions towards Australia and those taken toward the Biden administration in Washington in 2023. Specifically, Beijing's approach involved symmetry and fostering more stable relations. China has, in a sense, abandoned the conservative parties in the Five Eyes countries, Gupta said, referring to Australia, the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom as members of the Intelligence Sharing Pact. However, opportunities for relations with center-left parties are still perceived. The United Kingdom. It has been more belligerent toward the PRC since the Tories came to power. In general, New Zealand has only recently shifted to the right and abstained from the disputes between the United States and China. Gupta stated that Canada stands as an exception, as the centre-left government led by Justin Trudeau has consistently maintained tense relations with the PRC, including the retaliatory imprisonment of each other's citizens. Indeed, a change in government might stimulate an enhancement in bilateral ties. In conversations with authorities on this topic, the analogy of constructing a floor beneath the relationship to prevent it from deteriorating into something more severe than a rivalry recurred frequently. Gupta stated, China has no illusions that it can maintain amicable relations with any of these nations. In writing, Quiggin hypothesized that the Morrison administration's request for a COVID inquiry, which it ought to have known would have a low probability of success and likely strain relations with China, was primarily responsible for the initial dispute. More so than Albanese himself, the change of personnel induced by his ascension likely fostered closer ties, this would have likely occurred even if Morrison had been succeeded by his deputy party leader, Josh Frydenberg. According to James Curran, an international editor of the Australian Financial Review and a professor of history at the University of Sydney, the objective of Albanese's government has been stabilisation. This has resulted in regular dialogues and the October 2023 release of Chang Lei an Australian television reporter of Chinese descent who was detained in 2020 on vague national security charges and lifting trade restrictions. Curran stated, however, the Albanese government fundamentally maintains the strategic judgment of its predecessor that China's military build-up represents the most significant shift in the region's strategic landscape since World War II. As a result, Curran argued, Australia must be perceived as actively opposing the display of military might by China in solidarity with the United States and other allies. Additionally, experts on Australian security policy appear to be in broad accord that the Morrison administration did the majority of the legwork, especially regarding AUKUS. This agreement is unlikely to be undone at this time. Nevertheless, divergent opinions existed regarding the extent to which the United States and Australia would cooperate in forthcoming emergencies. Dobell stated, I cannot conceive of anything the United States could request, before or including Taiwan, that Australia would not, support. According to Gupta, the Australian national security establishment prioritised self-reliance and de-emphasised the US alliance in the aftermath of September 11, 2001. However, this stance has changed since 2016, with a renewed focus on integrating with partners, particularly the United States. Australia places forward defence in the region and maintains close ties with the United States, he explained. That is universally agreed upon. Quiggan, on the other hand, cites polling results indicating that Australians continue to desire an economic relationship with China in addition to their security partnership with the United States. I would even go so far as to say that the majority of Australians would prefer that our security alliance with the United States not place us in a conflict with China, he added. Curran reiterates concerns regarding the willingness of the Australian public to participate in US-led missions overseas, citing Australia's refusal to dispatch a warship to counter the Houthi assaults on commercial vessels in the Red Sea from Yemen. Curran stated, that may not have raised many eyebrows in Washington, but it certainly sparked a strong domestic reaction here, primarily from hawkish commentators accustomed to Canberra automatically agreeing to every US request. The government is adamant that its attention must be directed toward Asia. Taiwan is a possible complication that could arise in Australia's straddling endeavours. The CCP highly desires the democratically governed island across the strait for symbolic and practical reasons. 
Firstly, it would bring an abrupt conclusion to the division that the CCP opposed during the Chinese Civil War. Secondly, it would allow the People's Liberation Power to extend its influence internationally, completing a process that began with its official base in Djibouti and its apparent one in Cambodia. According to Benjamin Herskovich, a research fellow at the Australian National University, an aspect of AUKUS and its provision of nuclear-powered submarines that is often overlooked is the possibility that Australia could intervene in military conflicts that are further offshore, such as those in the Strait. Additionally, he highlights how the stance of Australian national security officials regarding Taiwan has changed. Under Morrison, they went from being opposed to considering a Taiwan contingency to concluding that Australia would inevitably be involved in any U.S. cross-strait conflict. Herskovich stated that under Albanese, the emphasis has shifted to doing much more now to ensure, an invasion or blockade of Taiwan, does not occur. To signal to Beijing that the costs are far too high. One potential approach to achieve this objective, without needing a military commitment to Taiwan's defense, is to capitalize on China's ongoing dependence on Australia for its resources, particularly the previously mentioned iron ore. China's domestic industry requires ore, but Australia's dependence on the ore trade is so significant that Herskovich refers to such threats as economic mad, mutually assured destruction. That could potentially bolster security, he further stated, noting that the increased US force posture in Australia has significantly altered the regional balance of physical power. The government of Albani could also increase relations with Taiwan, as have the governments of the United States and Japan. Australia previously hosted frequent visits to Taiwan by ministers and deputy ministers, however, such visits have ceased officially since 2012. Under Turnbull, Australia also acquiesced to pressure from the PRC to abandon its pursuit of a free trade agreement with Taiwan. Even though Taiwan is already one of Australia's largest trading partners, subsequent Australian administrations have not raised this objection. By attempting to straddle two fences, stated Herskovich. Protect the political relationship from plummeting once more while maintaining a cordial rapport with Taiwan. Sustenance and expansion of ties with Taiwan should not compromise China's relations. Although this may appear to rule out the possibility of more robust security and defense cooperation with Taiwan, Herskovich noted that some officials will sardonically remark, many things occur behind the scenes that are not televised. Thus, the government may not want us to know about certain developments unknown to us. Stabilization may not be an inherently negative development in and of itself. Even the Trump administration, which viewed China less as a partner to be nurtured and more as an adversary to be countered, reached a phase one trade agreement with China near the end of Trump's first term. However, observers quickly identified China's non-compliance with the contract, particularly regarding the increased procurement of products manufactured in the United States. Gupta observes that merely ensuring a consistent provision of essential resources is insufficient for China, it must also possess a dominant stake in their procurement. While Canberra has exhibited resistance to this inclination, Beijing has not surrendered. Beijing, for its part, has not abandoned its claim to Taiwan. The designation reunification would be imprecise in characterizing this development, given that Taiwan has never been under the governance of Communist China. Nevertheless, this does not deter the CCP from pursuing the island's acquisition, which would serve both symbolic and dispassionate strategic purposes. Others can rest assured that despite the public reconciliation with Beijing, Australia continues to monitor it suspiciously and implement measures to counterbalance its influence. However, if the calm continues and the CCP avoids the unintentional mistakes that characterized its wolf warrior period, this apprehension might transform into complacency.